we've had assumptions about food security. Some of those assumptions have not always been true. So like in the 1960s, there was a lot of international uh, in-kind food aid. You, you come in with uh, boats of food when in fact, what's really needed is a cash transfer would probably have been uh, the best thing to do. This is, this is where it matters. So if you, if you do your analysis well, you're able to zoom in on those factors so that the best decisions are made. My guest today is Jean-Martin Bauer. At the time of recording, he was the newly appointed country director in Haiti for the World Food Program. To put it simply, his job is to make sure people don't run out of food. And for a country like Haiti, that's no simple feat. I wanted to talk to Jean-Martin Bauer, uh, who's been working at the World Food Program for many years now, about his experience working with data and how that's helped on very pragmatic tasks like feeding people. Previously, Jean-Martin was a senior digital advisor, again at the World Food Program, where his job was to advocate for the use of data and how that can help their tasks. So now, in his current role as country director, I wanted to understand how they use data, and more specifically satellite images and maps, in order to help feed people. Before we get started, I wanted to say thank you to Element84, who's been kind enough to sponsor this podcast for a little while, and to thank them for their support. Element 84 is a geospatial software engineering company, and they focus on big earth data problems. One of the examples of the things they've done is they've taken the Sentinel-2 optical imagery and put it on AWS to make it a lot easier to find. I've actually had Dan Pallon, their CEO and co-founder, on the podcast on episode 16. So you can head to the show notes to find that episode and hear more about Element 84. With all of that said, here's my conversation with Jean-Martin Bauer. So hi Jean-Martin, uh, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. I'm quite excited to, to talk with you. Um, I don't know if you know, but I like uh, starting these conversations with the same question to my guest every single time. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. And so I'm quite curious to know how would you describe yourself? Thanks, Max. Thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. I describe myself as a, uh, um, as a geographer masquerading as a humanitarian. Uh, so I'm happy to be on missing maps. Uh, the, um, I was, got trained in, 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 in geography, uh, as an undergrad and, um, and, and human geography, not, the physical geography. I was interested in, uh, in places and people and the relationships between uh, themselves and how that shapes uh, the societies we live in. It's probably what drew me to um, the work I'm doing right now with the World Food Program in, in Haiti. Uh, so if you want to know who I am, um, probably geographer first. What I tell people is if, uh, well, when I retire from uh, my uh, my job here, uh, I, my business w- w- would probably say Jean-Martin Bauer, uh, geographer. So. What is humanitarian geography? You said it's it's not... It, it's focused on humanitarian, human geography. Like, what, what is that? Well, human geography is as is, is opposed to physical geography, which is uh, the, the the landscape, the soil, the uh, the flows, the atmosphere. Uh, and human geography is is is, is about um, how a place determines, um, well, determines or influences or affects uh, society in um, in terms of the. Yeah, the, the way society function, how uh, um, economies, uh, communities, businesses, individuals, uh, how all that is mediated through space. And I, I find that quite um, quite interesting because if, I mean, I also did a lot of economics and I think economics on its own doesn't tell the entire story. Um, I'm calling you today from Port-au-Prince, for instance, where... Uh, place and where you are in clusters of people who are alike or different, uh, explains a lot or, or is also an indicator of how, uh, society works. Uh, right here, you've got a, a city that's right by the sea that goes from, uh, um, sea level to, uh, almost, uh, one mile high. So 1600 meters and, and maybe 20 kilometers. So it's, it's very steep. Uh, uh, if you want to understand, um, how poverty and inequalities turn into humanitarian issues in this country. You have to understand the geographies of, uh, uh, of the poverty, the geographies of access to resources, the geographies of inequality. And, um, an economist, uh, I think would find a good friend and a geographer. Uh, and I think if you bring both of those disciplines together, you, 
uh, you begin to disaggregate and illuminate things in a way you're not, you wouldn't be able to uh, if, if, if they were working um, in silos. So that's what I think the power of geography brings. Um, and human geography is about how human beings uh, lives day to day uh, and, and, and the structures and patterns of the societies they live in is influenced by, uh, by space and place. Do, do you have like examples of that? I, th I think to a lot of people it, it, it makes sense, but I'd, I'd still be curious to know if you have any examples where you've seen that. Let, let's, let me give you an example, Max. So, I mean, I, I live in, I used to live, I mean, until a month ago, I lived in New York. Uh, and uh, New York's a city with uh, millions of people. It's gigantic, one of the top cities in the world. Um, great place to be. Um, but if you dig down into what New York is like, uh, you realize that um, each part of Manhattan is a little bit different. Uh, the, the sort of the thing that tourists say is that, uh, or that tourists are told is that New York is in fact 200 villages um, and not just, uh, not more than a big city. But I, I lived in Midtown East and not far from the UN, which is um, a very specific neighborhood. And that's where uh, you will walk into a bar and uh, meet other UN people you haven't seen in meetings. And there's this sort of magic that operates because you meet uh, people with uh, the, the same mindset, uh, some similar opinions. Um, and, um, and, and, and this, this, in fact, the people and the institutions based in that part of New York feed off each other. So if it's uh, the UN, the universities, the hospitals, the, the restaurants, and, and, and they actually create a um, a fairly cohesive community. Um, and uh, that's my experience in, 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 in Manhattan, uh, that um, space and being in the same uh, area actually influences how um, business is done and how uh, a social system operates. But sa the same is true with uh, Silicon Valley. I mean, why do you have this big cluster of companies uh, that work on technology in the same place? Because there's a huge benefit to being co-located into um, being not too far one from the other uh, because you, you get multipliers, you get the positive effects, you get synergies. Uh, and that's something that space brings. It's, 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 the, it's something that uh, proximity uh, brings that you wouldn't, you wouldn't really get otherwise. Now, of course, uh, we've been talking a lot about how uh, the pandemic um, has changed um, the way we work with uh, more remote work, with uh, people not necessarily being in the office as much. So this is probably going to change in some way. Uh, but the reality is that uh, people do seek out spaces. Um, people who are creative um, quite often uh, seek out the same neighborhoods, the same parts of town. You can think of Soho in, in London, or you could think of uh, uh, areas like that. And that's that's really why um, um, human spaces matter uh, to, um, uh, in, 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 in our lives. But then th th there's also a flip side to that. You've got um, um, also geographies of inequality and... Um, there are, there are very different ways of, of talking about those, but um, if, if I, so I'm, I'm, I'm up here in, in, in the hills of Port-au-Prince and down there you've got neighborhoods that are controlled by, by gangs uh, where uh, you've got uh, malnutrition affecting one out of five children. And again, they're clustered in specific spaces. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like people are determined to, uh, to food insecurity and malnutrition if you live in one of those neighborhoods. People do have agency. Um, uh, but it is, uh, it, it's an interesting lens to analyze the society we live in to, to see these, um, um, these patterns, these clusters, because um, they make you ask uh, more questions and, and, and they, they challenge your assumptions about um, the type of work we do. I guess I was actually expecting you to, to go on a completely different scale and be like, well, if you're based in an area with very fertile ground, like that's where agriculture is going to be less of a problem than somewhere else. And and like I was kind of expecting that that sort of answer and where the geography of the place where you are, if you have access to to the sea and there's a lot of fish, you know, that's a, a place where food might be less of a problem, something like that. But what you're telling me is that it's it's also about who the other people are around you that have a, a determining role in, in what happens to yourself as as an individual as well. Well, yeah, Max, I, I'm not I'm not that much of a believer in the uh, you know, determinist. Uh, if if you've got land, you're not hungry. That it's it's I think it's food security is much more complicated than that, and it is about the the social relationships, the social capital, um, and. Um, I mean, I don't want to go go back to to, to trite stereotypes, but 
you, you do have in, in, in the world very arid um, uh, areas that are quite food secure and then uh, places uh, where I've lived in in Central Africa that are as green and well watered and sunny as you want, but with, uh, with huge food insecurity issues. So it does come down to the people and the relationships between them. Uh, hunger in our day and age, uh, it's about conflict. It's about uh, social inequalities. I, 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 of course, you, you, where you've got conflict and, and social inequalities in a context where the land is extremely poor and the weather's bad, that's where you get uh, the, the worst, the worst outcomes. But, uh, um, but I tend, I, I tend to start with, uh, with social relationships, social inequalities, um, the, the socially mediated access to resources. That's, that's what matters. So let's get a little bit into your 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 new role right now. Um, can you? So you were at the World Food Program. Can you explain a little bit what your current role is right now? Because uh, I think it's quite interesting to go a little bit on that. So um, my current role, I'm WFP's country director in Haiti. I arrived here uh, almost a month ago, not quite. So I'm still very new to the to the role. Um, I've um um. Actually, I haven't been to Haiti in 25 years. So for me, I'm I'm adjusting my um, my assumptions about this place. Uh, it's what I've been doing over the past uh, few weeks. It's a country that's uh, suffered a lot, and uh, I think what what really shocked me was when I I, um, I came here on May 23rd, and uh, I was shocked to see from the plane how the landscape's been scarred uh, by decades of deforestation. I I come to Haiti in um, 1997 and 1998. Uh, uh, for a few months each time, and uh, back then deforestation was a was a huge issue. And what what, what I'm seeing now is that uh, everything that people were fearing in the 1990s has um, come to life. You've got uh, rivers that have turned into um, uh, huge gullies uh, with with carrying sand into the plains or in, and into the sea. Uh, there's there's been a huge loss of uh, um, of cropland uh, and uh, huge erosion um, and to me, it, it really looks like we're creating a new version of the Sahel here in the, in the Caribbean. So uh, that to me was, was, was especially shocking. So I'm trying to understand these, these different things. Of course, one of the, the, the major challenges for food security in Haiti right now is the, uh, um, the fact that there is, um, the, there are between 150 and 200 gangs uh, in, in Port-au-Prince. Uh, and um, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, insecurity and, and, and that's, that's affecting people. And I, I, I need to, um, I'm trying to understand exactly how that all works. Um, so that, uh, WFP's programs here, um, um, do the right thing for, uh, for, for the people who are most vulnerable in this country. Now, what I did before was, was different. Uh, I was with WFP in, in New York, as I said, uh, a little earlier. And what I did there was, uh, I was working on digital. I was, uh, advising, uh, WFP on, uh, um, I'd say on, on digital writ large, but what I was busy with day to day was looking at how the UN um, is changing the way it works uh, in a day and an age where uh, technology and digital technology is changing everything around us. The uh, Secretary General of the UN adopted uh, something he called the uh, uh, Roadmap for Digital Cooperation in 2020. And um, that sets out in broad brush strokes what the UN should be doing uh, to make the world a better place by leveraging digital tech. And it, it, it talks about universal connectivity. Um, the, uh, that, that roadmap also talks about, uh, things like open source and digital public goods. Uh, it's, it's a very ambitious, uh, uh, roadmap. It, it also, it's got a lot about protection, uh, about, uh, making sure people aren't left behind that uh, human rights are respected, uh, uh, online as they are offline. Um, so all of this is, is means that the agencies that are part of the UN need to, um, need to sit down and think about how the work they're doing is being uh, transformed by the new digital world we, we, we live in. So, I mean, I'm saying new, it's been around for, for, for decades now, but the, what's changing now is that there's a, there's a political push to do this better, to be, uh, uh, to do this responsibly and to think strategically about, uh, about these impacts. Um, so that was, that was my job in New York was to make sure WST engaged, uh, in these discussions and, uh, that we also contributed, um, uh, um, and, and, and shared what, um, what we had to show with, with them. So we are a, an operational agency. We have uh, areas of excellence in terms of, uh, um, uh, use of big data where we've also been, uh, one of the big agencies that's taken on digital cash transfers. So we've done, um, more than $2 billion a year of, uh, uh, of cash transfers, most of which is digitally enabled. So we, we don't do cash in envelopes that much anymore. The we beneficiaries usually have some, uh, some form of, um, 
uh, a payment card or a, a mobile money account. And, and these are the, the, the platforms that Lyft uses to push out payments. Um, and, and therefore, um, sharing that experience on the New York scene was uh, also something um, I was um, I was I was doing. And of course, there was the, the usual networking with um, uh, other partners in New York. And uh, um, if it's if it's the universities in New York, the NGOs that are there, uh, again, it's a it's the type of city where you meet people uh, with similar interests, no matter how niche uh, they might be. Uh, and that's um, um, yeah, that was that's what I was up to there. So at a, an advisory role. Um, in New York and here at an operational role. Uh, but this is, this is more or less how I've, I've done my career. I mean, I've, I've, I started working in West Africa uh, for WP 20 years ago. I did uh, a few operational posts, uh, moved to the regional bureau in Dakar where I did the market analysis for a few years, uh, then moved to the headquarters of WFP in Rome. Uh, and that's where I started working on, on um, automated uh, data collection, automated surveys uh, in um, different parts of the world. This this was in 2012. We were uh, sort of blazing the trail on, on that, on, on acquiring data from difficult places using uh, things like IVR, uh, SMS, and then other mechanisms. After that, WP thought, hey, uh, Sean Martin should go back to operations. And I, I, I spent a few years in uh, in Congo as WFP's representative in, in Brazzaville. Um, after that, New York, and then and then here. So I, I I like to think I bring both the operational perspective, but also a uh, um, knowledge of how data can help uh, humanitarians um, do their job better. Yeah, that's something I'd like to get a little bit more into, especially since you you seem to have had like multiple roles at, at, at different angles on that. Like I'm I'm sure that the work that you're doing is probably going to leverage some of the digital work that you've done before. On 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 one of the things I was curious, for example, is how do we how do you know the the food situation in a country i was looking at there's a there's a hunger map that's done by um the wfp and that's i was right. looking at haiti just before the recording and you go on there and it's it's like red it's the the whole and most of the country there's food insecurity and the, the question that pops to my mind is how do we know that H how do you assess the situation to, to, to be honest, um, you, you don't need the hunger map to tell you that there's a problem in Haiti. It's um, it, it's it's well known, um, but the the hunger map helps you um, be a little bit more deliberate with the questions you ask. And food insecurity is a very abstract term, and it's it's made up of different components. And um, I, I, I think you. We've had assumptions about food security uh, historically. This is when I say we, this is the, the food security community. Um, and and I think some of those assumptions have not always been true. So we we assume that uh, things about food production, for example, that lack of food production equals uh, food insecurity, which isn't the case. Um, and uh, we've, we've made mistakes in the past in terms of uh, what type of um, response option uh, or, is appropriate uh, for, for 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 specific context. Could so you expand the, on that a little bit? Well, look, uh, and this is this is in the, like in the nineteen sixties. Uh, there was a lot oh, of uh, okay, international right. uh, in kind food aid. You you come in with uh, boats of food when, um, in fact, what's really needed is uh, a cash transfer. Would probably have been uh, the best thing to do. And uh, but again, I mean, uh, an agency like like WFP is able to do both and and does analyze things quite quite thoroughly. And that that and and in fact, Max, this is this is. Where it matters. So if you if you do your analysis well, you're able to zoom in on those factors so that the best decisions are made. Um, so it's, I think what's what's not um, well, it, it is interesting to know uh, whether a country is in trouble or not, and you know where they are on that scale. You know, you know is it uh, uh, a yellow and orange or a red, or or you know for for specific areas, is it a yellow and orange or a red or even a green? Um, but it's also why. I mean, what's going on? Is it uh, is it because of conflict? Uh, what's the role of climate uh, in it? How are the markets doing? Um, and um, that's what's really interesting about food security analysis is that these factors keep changing. I mean, um, I've been amazed in, in in my career as a food security analyst to see that sometimes things just flip on a dime. I mean, in in, in just a few weeks, the situation totally totally changes. Um, I think you had that with the, the war in Ukraine. I mean, the situation was not, not very good. Um, the global food security situation wasn't very good with high food prices and, uh, uh, food inflation already in early, um, 22. But, um, as soon as that war started, uh, we faced a very new and painful reality, uh, worldwide. So, uh, food security, uh, analysis also asked, uh, be flexible enough to, um, 
capture these dynamic, um, these dynamic events. A country like Haiti, for instance, relies on imports for 80% of the rice that's consumed. I think the majority of food that's uh, eaten in Haiti is actually imported by, by value. Um, and something like, uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine, um, is, um, a huge risk for, for, for countries with, uh, an import, but what, what, with, with depend, dependency on imports. So, um, and that's, that's also true if you look at the country itself and, and, you know, what's going on in the North or the South or the different, um, um, different parts of the country, they all have a, a specific profile and you need to, to get acquainted with those. Um, and, um, with food security as in very many other areas of, of, of um, well, humanitarian practice, uh, one size does not fit all. Uh, you need to be able to, um, uh, get acquainted with, uh, the communities and the, um, um, the different contexts in which the, an agency might operate to, to get things right. Um, might be okay to have more of a macro, uh, approach in a, in a fast breaking emergency, but to really get things right, uh, you need the data, you need to understand the problem, you need to disaggregate it. And hopefully, uh, the agency and its partners are flexible enough to, to have the, the response that's just right for that, uh, for that environment. Can we dive into a little bit deeper on, on how you get that data and, and how you analyze it? So, so there, there, uh, thankfully there, there, there's a lot of data that's available now. I, I mean, we've got a lot more data now than we did, um, um, say two decades ago when I started in, in the Sahel in West Africa, um, I think we'd get a, I mean, if we were lucky, we would get a, a weekly bulletin on uh, rainfall and then another weekly bulletin with food prices. Um, and if you were smart, I mean, you'd, you'd string these together for a few years and try to understand whether you were in a situation that was uh, normal or anomalous. And that was helpful. I mean, don't get me wrong. That was helpful. But what I think what we need, um, uh, is, is something that's more detailed in order to, to drive decision-making, uh, and allocations of resources and programs. So, uh, what I've seen in, in the past two decades is, a a, a much increased availability of data of all types, um, in, in the countries we work in. Uh, that means, uh, we get the satellite data, um, almost in real time. Uh, you get weather forecasts, uh, that are much more detailed. Um, and we're, we're also, we also have information on, um, on, on households. Uh, again, when I started out, we would do these large household surveys, uh, roving teams of specially trained enumerators would go out with, uh, either paper or, or, or tablets. And they, they, they'd go out and collect, uh, thousands of, uh, of questionnaires and that would be brought back to the Capitol and a report would come out like nine months after you made the decision to do a survey, sometimes more. Um, and I mean, again, the, the, the data is useful, but it's not dynamic and food security is, uh, um, quintessentially dynamic. People can't wait nine months to eat. No, yeah, no, no, you can't. So, um, so what you need is, a, of course you, you do need that, that baseline knowledge of food security, but the, the dynamic, uh, aspect of it is essential. So what's also changes, it's not just the, the, that there's more data there is that, uh, for instance, what my colleagues did in, in Rome, uh, Jonathan Rivers and his team in, in Rome, uh, has set up, uh has been to use artificial intelligence, has been to use machine learning to predict food insecurity on the basis of indicators that are updated very regularly. Um, so usually when we, when I talk about food security, it's something that's measured at the household level. Uh, it's, uh, how many people in, in area X are not eating a sufficient diet. I mean, that's, that's usually how, uh, we, we, we would want to define food insecurity. Um, that's actually something that's, uh, that requires a lot of data acquisition, um, you can lessen that burden by doing things like, uh, doing a remote survey or, um, what we can, what we've been doing more recently is predicting that. Uh, so what the Jonathan and his team has been doing is, uh, looking at, uh, rainfall, looking at food prices, looking at, uh, uh, vegetation indices, looking at night lights, um, and, um, predicting household level food insecurity, thanks to machine learning. And this is, um, actually quite accurate. Uh, it's been peer reviewed and, and, um, what this means is that we're now able to um, have a pretty good idea of what food security is like in a specific community, uh, thanks to these, to, to these mechanisms. So they lessen the data collection burden. You get your data quickly and you're therefore able to, to, to work in a way that's, um, um, that's more flexible. Now, of course it's, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's a panacea. Uh, I want to be really honest that these are new tools. Uh, they're very difficult for, uh, 
um, people who are not uh, sort of in the club to understand. Uh, and there's a lot of work to do uh, with um, within the humanitarian space, uh, with governments, with communities, so that these tools are understood. Uh, there are really good examples of how these tools have helped uh, WFP uh, adjust responses. In the case of Yemen, what the, the example I've heard is that uh, we were able to detect with the hunger map uh, live uh, deterioration of food insecurity in a part of Yemen. I think in Yemen, they bring in conflict data as well. So you, the conflict data is also uh, used as a... Uh, um, as a factor in, in the estimate of, uh, of food insecurity. And what the WFP office in Yemen was able to do was to increase coverage. So more people in that area got food, but also for longer. So they increased the rations. And that means that people, more people got more food as a result of a machine learning um, um, product. And, and I think that's, that's really interesting for us. But before you get there, and I think that's the exception, we're, we, we do have a, a lot of socialization, um, other methodology to do. We need to build capacities um, all over the, the humanitarian um, community within uh, the UN, the NGOs, uh, with the governments we work with, especially the uh, civil protection um, uh, bodies that exist, the, uh, the bodies that do early warning uh, so that we get to something that's better. Um, there's, a, there's actually quite a big uh, gap between, um, I'd say, the discussions I heard in New York or that I heard in Rome, and the reality and the practice in a place like Haiti or in a place like Congo. Yeah. What can you go into some examples of like what might be some of those differences? Because also what I'm understanding is that what you're saying is these models are are um, they they seem to use a lot of remote sensing or um, quite global data sets that 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 help get a very global. Um, coverage, but I, I'm guessing very on a much more local scale, the discrepancy must must change quite a lot. And so, how do you deal with that? And and what are the differences between, you know, a team in Rome and then using that on the ground in Haiti? Well, I, I think the the issue is um, again, one size does not fit all, and each country is just very different. And, and having a global map is great; so it's a great tool. But then um, the next step is is actually having a local version of that. Um, my, my, my colleagues who work in the, the same department uh, at WFP Rome created a, a tool they called PRISM. Uh, it's a, a tool that, it's a, it's a front end uh, that combines climate data uh, from uh, different sources, from different meteorology departments. It's a very interesting tool, but what they did, they didn't create a global um, climate dashboard. They customized it uh, for, for different countries. They started doing that in Sri Lanka, and they, they also had other, um, uh, other implementations of it. And uh, I think where you get value in those tools is when you actually sit down with the national authorities and, and the partners and, and figure out what's, what's needed in that context. Um, and um, so in addition to these global dashboards, you know, maybe you do need those at a global level for advocacy, for media, for, for, um, uh, for strategy. Um, but you're going you're, you're to need highly customized uh, versions of those tools um, in, um, in the countries we, we work in uh, that are uh, customized with the, the people making the decisions, uh, with, um, the, within the sort of the very intricate, uh, uh, Weber relationships that, that, that exists in these countries. I, I remember in, in, in Congo, we worked with, um, um, we worked with cloud to street on a, um, cloud, well, on a, excuse me, on a flood mapping, uh, of Congo. And what we realized was that, uh, um, what we designed, um, as a, um, the flood dashboard wasn't terribly, uh, wasn't exactly what people needed, uh, in, in Congo. We, we, we realized that we were facing, um, 17 different agencies and, you know, and Congo is not a big country. I'm talking about the Republic of Congo, by the way. Um, short, I, I say, I use Congo as shorthand, but this is the right bank of the Congo. It's a country of about, uh, 5 million people, size of Montana, Congo and Mubangi River. So flood risk is a big deal over there. Uh, it's also a middle income country with some resources, but, the the, when there's a flood in that country, it, it is 17 agencies, 17 government agencies that are that are responsible for the response, and then you've got the UN agencies and the NGOs helping out. Um, so uh, there's no way you're going to design uh, from outside a tool that's going to be useful for Congo. You need to, to sit down with them and see um, who they are, what the relationships are like. Um, I mean, I don't even think I could give you all 17, but you had uh, the mid agency, which was under the I think that was under the Ministry of Interior. There was like a, aviation was also there. Um, uh, social affairs, um, 
Um, the fire service was involved, the police, the, I mean, it, 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 it was a, I mean, the, the army ministry of defense was, was, was involved. So they just had a, a huge set of stakeholders. And, um, I think what ended up working for, um, uh, for, for us in Congo was actually delivering the product in a way that was, um, um, useful to, to, to the folks who were furthest, uh, on, on the front line. And it ended up looking like a, uh, a maps that could be shared by WhatsApp because everyone was on WhatsApp in, in Congo. So they would get, um, sort of very low, local or relevant maps. Cause we, I think that the first step we had was we, so we create this, this dashboard and, you know, people could zoom in and scroll and, uh, um, toggle different fields and, you know, no one, no one was, was visiting that. I mean, maybe it was us in the WFP, WFP office, but we actually got a lot more visits, uh, um, when we started, um, uh, pushing it out by WhatsApp in a way that was much more user friendly, um, and, uh, more adapted and, and to, to, the, to the way people do business day to day in, 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 in Congo. So. Um, a, a big part of the journey, I mean, this is a long way to say that the, a big part of the journey is just, um, um, un understanding the, the, the context you're in and not making the assumption that your brilliant global product is going to be the right solution in, in, in countries as complex as the ones we work in. And it, it, it sounds like there's a, a whole other step. It's not just about like making that map or, or that data set, but distributing it and, and, and putting it in the hands of the people who can actually do something with it. Right. And that, that's just so far from obvious. Uh, and, um, I, I, I think this is a, an area where we would find a lot of value, um, by putting information in the hands of those who, uh, who need them. Um, I realized that, I mean, there's been some really interesting work in South Africa on community early warning systems. Um, I, I actually met someone from, from South Africa who, um, was showing me how a, a flood, uh, uh, well, a community that lived with considerable flood risk, uh, would exchange information informally, um, and therefore, um, better manage their flood risk that way. Um, so there's what we're doing as institutions that's formal, institutional, top down. Uh, and then you've got those bottom up initiatives uh, that I found really interesting. And I'd love to see a, a handshake uh, between formal and informal early warning systems and see how those can, um, again, help us uh, get better information and help the right people when, uh, when needed. So not just so, so like get the people involved as well in, in, in bringing their knowledge and in helping out with that. Is, is, is that right? And, and, and in principle, technology is, is, is there to, to help us do that. So, uh, now that, uh, well, I mean, South Africa again is, is a very, very specific place, but if, uh, um, if, if, if people have, um, uh, a, a cell phone and a data plan and there, there's just so much you can do to, um, um, um ensure that data is shared in some way. I mean, you have to share it in a way that's responsible and useful, but, uh, I, I definitely see, see a lot of potential, um, and, um, in making sure that we're not, that we're, first of all, asking the right questions, that we understand what the issues might be, um, and that we involve, um, people who are affected by these, uh, uh, by these hazards and these risks, uh, and involve them in the whole planning. Uh, I mean, I just told you about the 17 government departments in Congo, but I, I didn't tell you how we would do community outreach in Congo because it's actually quite complicated to do there, but there, there, to me, there, there definitely seems to be a, a strand of work that, that, um, that we can't ignore, uh, which is how do you bring information from communities themselves to, to the table? Could, could, could you expand a little bit on that? Um, maybe quickly, like how you approach that? Well, I, I think the, um, you would need a perspective and context whenever you, you've got, um, um, a, um, a, a food crisis. And I, I always get a lot, uh, personally, when I, when I speak to the old timers in the communities, they will tell you, this is the worst, uh, um, I'd say the, the I'd say the worst flood since 1960. And, uh, you know, th these are things you can kind of, um, it helps you understand what's going on. Um. And they also also tell you how they're managing, how they're um, um, how they're coping, uh, what they need, uh, and uh, and I think the 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 problem that comes up time and again is that uh, I mean we we will as humanitarians uh, set up um, uh, an assistance program. We've got a complaints and feedback mechanism, um, but what you'd want to do is is also engage with the communities as early as you can uh, before before there's uh, there's a humanitarian need that arises. So. Um, being able to um, um, have 
some type of relationship with uh, either community representatives, um, local NGOs, uh, or, or, or other local interests, uh, that, that, that always helps you, um, ask the right questions, uh, understand what's going on. I mean, mostly when, 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 when something, um, when a disaster happens and maybe this isn't the case of like a massive, like hurricane or, 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 or flood type of disaster, but it's always, you know, the local churches or, or locals, uh, will, will reach out and say, there's a problem here, please come investigate, you know, and then we'll, we will go out with our very standard disaster tools. But, uh, I, I'm, I'm, what I would hope to see is, is, is a way, um, is a world where we're able to, um, to have that, um, uh, exchange between formal and informal, uh, mechanisms, uh, that, uh, in a way that, that reinforces, um, uh, each other in a way that's standing, um, and, um, of course you, 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 you the, the, the issue would be, how do you standardize, um, information that comes from a, a local community in a place like, uh, like Haiti or, or, or Congo or wherever, um, but I'd hope this is something, uh, or, or managers and our technologists and, uh, or so, sociologists will, uh, will figure out. I wanted to come back on the, on the like online human right that you were talking about earlier. I think mm -hmm. this is a, a, a concept that we don't hear about very much. Uh, at least I don't hear about it very much where I think when you're a data scientist or you, you work with maps or a technologist, you get really excited about the, the getting more data basically because you, you see oh we can do all these really cool stuff and we can get all these new insights and all these stuff that we can do but we we sometimes forget these are real people behind it, it it's it's data that means something it represents something C can you expand a little bit on some of the work maybe that's been done around online human rights and what that is maybe where it came from as well yeah, well, I, I think um, in, the, in the case of the, um, the United Nations, it comes from uh, our mandate uh, as, as an organization that's the, the custodian of uh, the Human Rights Charter. And uh, um, the, the, the UN is uh, expected to, um, uh, to be a leader uh, in this space and uh, a forum where these discussions can, um, can happen. And um, I've seen uh, OHCHR, which is the Human Rights Office at the, at the UN, um, do very important work in, in this space. Um, it's not really my area of expertise. Um, right. I think the way I've, um, I've looked at it has really been through the lens of data responsibility. Uh, when you're a, a data person, uh, working, uh, with the UN, um, in, in contexts, um, like the conflicts, uh, or the, um, the emergencies we've, uh, we've experienced over the past, uh, decades, you, you, you're very quickly uh, brought to the, um, the realization that, um, data protection and, and data responsibility is an essential, um, feature of any information system you set up because you, um, as an analyst, you will start seeing in your data things that, uh, go beyond, um, food security analysis. We'll see that, uh, and you, you understand the drivers of the conflict, understand, uh, a lot more. Uh, about the conflict, then let, let's say you're just running a very simple food security questionnaire. Um, you soon realize that uh, the data you capture um, could be used or misused. Uh, and um, right. that means that uh, as, as an analyst, uh, you have a huge responsibility. And the call about what data to collect, uh, how to process, how to store, uh, how to manage data shouldn't be up to the individual. And, uh, when I was working with, uh, the world food programs headquarters in Rome, and when we started doing automated surveys, very quickly, we started working with, uh, the, um, with, with HHI and signal program at Harvard, uh, to, uh, to work on principles of ethical data collection. Uh, we started engaging with uh, the Leiden University Center for Innovation on, on responsible data practice. We began engaging with the OCHA uh, Center for Humanitarian Data, and um, I think that those those partners helped us um, ensure we were at least asking the right questions before we started to, um, to collect data. And uh, I think it led to a professionalization of what we were doing, and. Um, it's, it's, 
the journey we we had in the in the team I I, I just mentioned uh, is is something that's taking place at a much broader scale uh, in in the humanitarian community. At WFP, we were pleased to have hired one of the first uh, data protection officers in the UN. Not the first, but one of the first. Uh, her name is Carmen. Uh, Carmen Casado works in uh, at HQ in Rome, um, and she's got the authority within WFP to to, to guide the agency on on data protection issues, and uh, that that shows that um, agencies are now taking data protection and privacy extremely seriously. That the governance around data protection and privacy uh, has taken a, a leap forward. It did take um, um, like the first. Um, I, th I think we we had uh, a, a few years where that all well, that was taking shape, but where we're at today, um, we've got the, the right people, the right um, governance mechanisms in place to, to make sure we're doing our, our, our job properly. I, I'm quite curious. Like I I work in the Earth observation field. Uh, most like one of the big trends we're seeing is the like what's called new space, which is like a lot of um, private companies are, are emerging and they're able to create new data sets that we didn't have before. Like, are these um, data sets that you, you can, are, that, that you are leveraging at, at WFP where we have higher coverage, like more resolution, for example, be it in time or spatially. We were talking about weather forecasts um, before that there's like a, a big, push for with new companies trying to provide better um more granular weather forecasts but those are private companies that are selling the data compared to um, open programs like blandsat like copernicus um what's kind of the it, it, are you seeing a change in that sense and what is that um what does that look like well again i've seen much more data become available uh, and i've seen um well, colleagues leverage to great effect the um, the imagery that they get from Copernicus and, and Landsat. Um, and um, what I found quite um, useful has been uh, the higher resolution of those data products, uh, the fact that we're able to combine them with other uh, data sets in a way to, uh, that delivers um, insight more quickly uh, at a scale that's uh, um, much more localized. And that's in, I mean, in, in theory and principle, it's 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 quite uh, quite useful for uh, opera humanitarian responders. I think with the private companies, I'm I'm not sure we're quite there yet. Um, cost is still a barrier. Uh, that data is still behind a, a paywall somewhere. Um, I've seen um, some companies uh, release and um, data on an ad hoc basis to to, to, to some of their partners, which. Uh, I mean, I, I understand, but what we really need is to get to a place where uh, private data, which accounts for a large percentage of the overall data that's out there, we we, we need access to that to do ML, uh, to, to to do machine learning. And if we if we don't have access to it, we'll get into trouble. Um, what I'd like to see, and in, 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 um, you know, this is more than just geospatial data, but it's um, I, I'd love to see a, an open AI movement take place where. Uh, uh, the data itself uh, and libraries could be could be shared in a way that's uh, totally open uh, for humanitarian purposes. But this whole space um, has to be designed uh, so that uh, private companies don't uh, lose their competitive advantage, and, and and we really need them to be on board. Uh, my my colleagues who work at the WFP Accelerator in Munich have been doing very interesting work with Google Research. Uh, they've uh, set up a a project. Uh, um, and I'm forgetting its name right now. Oh, okay. So the project is called Sky, S K A I. Uh, and uh, what that project does is they, they use uh, uh, machine learning to um, um, essentially um, classify damage to buildings in disaster affected areas. So uh, imagine the explosion in Beirut. Uh, I think they, they tested out the uh, uh, the system on on that scenario. So so you you, you get the imagery feed that into Sky and Sky spits out a map that's uh, uh, basically 90% accurate with um, the, the, the buildings tagged um, in uh, light, medium, or, or severe uh, damage, if you see what I mean, Max. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, yeah. that's something we were able to do with Google, and I think Google was, was, was actually trying to, to, to work with us to make that open source. Um, and the, these are the things we need to do. Uh, so that's one of the applications that, that needs to be uh, done, but there, there are many others. And um, 
from from these these pilots and these um um sort of the, the, these isolated projects we we do need to um and what I'm hoping I'll, I'll see is, is, is uh, a move towards a um, um, a world where we're able to to have an, an open AI um, for 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 imagery for for um, I'd say for 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 individual statistics. I mean, I'm not saying uh, people's names or anything would be would be shared openly, but uh, uh, but survey data definitely needs to be shared in a way that's um, that enables. Um, uh, better use and 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 the uh um and, and the use of of methodologies like like machine learning. So so that's I think where we where we need to be going. It's it's still early days. How how do you think we we get there? Um, what what is in it for those private companies that? Well, I think so, some private companies see the the benefit uh, of 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 working in um uh, in low resource settings. Uh, they I think they always learn a lot from from working with us. But I think those who really can help us are the universities. Um, there's the work of Monica Lamb at Stanford that I find a very, um, um, and I think has a lot of potential for for humanitarians. Um, so we need I, we we need a, an institution like a university to work here because uh, I'm not sure a Google would work on uh, an under resourced language and what they call under resourced languages in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. Um, but if you want to use machine learning, uh, you're going to have to, um, someone has to do it. Uh, and I think a, a university is probably the right uh, type of, uh, institution to do that with rigor. Um, and, um, and with the public interest in mind, uh, and, and to, 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 to keep, um, um, the knowledge, uh, in, in, in the public, uh, public setting. And, uh, I would love to see, uh, UN agencies and humanitarian agencies work with, um, um, partners like that to, uh, um, to enable the, uh, the change that we, we need to see in the, um, um, in the open AI or open data space. Yeah. I think the, the open AI name is, is, is already taken. I, I don't know if you're familiar. It is. Yeah. A, this, yeah. <laughs> they, they have a bit of a, a, um, changing reputation, let's say about their, their, their ethos and their work where like holding things back. Um, under the assumption that it, it, it would not be beneficial to open up algorithms to the world. It would, it would be more detrimental than, than beneficial. Um, at least that's their mm -hmm. own argument. But what, what, what you're talking about is, is not that company. It's more like a, a movement of like, like open data, but for machine learning. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm not talking about open AI, the company, but open AI, the, uh, um, yeah, which would be, uh, essentially a coalition of partners who work together to make, um, um, data available. I mean, there's a big data access problem right now in the community. Um, there are initiatives, uh, at the world bank, uh, at the UN, uh, to access private data for humanitarian purposes. Uh, and I, I think data access is, is one of the, one of the major issues, but it's not, it's not uh, all of the issue. You also have the, uh, again, um, can we share models? Can we share libraries? Uh, can we, can we leverage what others have done in the AI space? If we're not able to do that, unfortunately, I suspect that, uh, we'll see much duplication of, uh, of work. Um, people might, um, consider AI to be a, a black box, uh, just, just the way humanitarian coordination works. Just imagine showing up in a meeting in a country like Haiti and, uh, Agency X walks in with a map and they said, we did this with artificial intelligence and no one understands what it really means because they haven't had access to the algorithm. That's, you know, those are the risks you're, 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 you're facing. So, uh, having things open, um, open for scrutiny, um, auditable that builds trust and what you can't, um, afford to um, jeopardize in, in setting was trust. I heard you on a on a, an other podcast that you did. You you were mentioning that, like you were moving towards like a machine learning first world where it it started where a lot of the first insights came from those those models that you were talking about. Like so, how do you build that trust where more and more it it seems like WFP is moving in that direction about getting insights derived from algorithms. How do you build that trust with the people to be like, 
this is 90% accuracy. Like people are going to be like, great. What about the 10% that's left? How do you, like you and I probably understand that, but people who aren't familiar might not. How do you go about building that trust? Well, th those are not easy conversations at all. And we shouldn't um, assume they, they, they would be. Uh, you're always facing a, a group of people who've been doing something in a way that's, um, you know, that's done the job that hasn't, that's done the job for a long time. Um, but that could be improved. And um, part of the challenge is converting uh, those, that constituency to doing things in a different way. So in the case of um, damage assessments, uh, maybe damage assessments isn't a great example because you don't have people uh, who were damage assessors, but uh, just think of household surveys. Um, you do have an institute of statistics in every country and, uh, and, you know, and they do surveys with, um, uh, with, with international partners all the time, uh, and they're used to, uh, uh, having a huge survey book and, uh, being trained for a week before going out. And, and, and so there's, there's that, that's an entire system and, and an entire way of doing things that's very entrenched. And if you're telling them, well, look, uh, we're going to use machine learning and we'll look at high resolution satellite imagery to map out poverty. Thank you very much. You know, that, that just disrupts, um, uh, something that's been going on for a long time. So, um, for me, it's, it's, it's about engaging, uh, with, uh, you know, not just the people who would be disrupted, but, um, um, uh, but engaging with everyone about, about the value proposition of, of the new system, making sure you're not selling snake oil, um, because sometimes people will sell snake oil and uh, you end up in a situation where uh, you, you, you undermine trust and you haven't created trust in a new system. So uh, you need to, to validate, um, uh, to be uh, rigorous, uh, to have some humility about it all. So um, what, what seems to, to work for me is when um, uh, you're able to, to, to publish the paper, uh, if you work with uh, a credible academic partner, with uh your local partner as well that that's where you you know the the mindsets start to shift uh and um it's not as easy as as, as parachuting into a country and saying we've got a new way of doing things it's cheaper let's go uh it's 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 a much longer term process and um but you know things things do change i mean um just think about where where we were um 20 years ago with, with food security analysis, with uh, much less data, with um, uh, very different processes. These things can change, but we, we do need to invest in, um, not just in the technology platform, but in, in the, the processes of introducing these things and making sure they are, uh, um, they, they, they fit in and that they do add value. Yeah, it, I think in, in the tech sector, it feels like disruptive is a very good thing. Like you want to disrupt everything, but you're you're saying like no that's actually not a good thing to come in and just just try and change everything like that's what disruption is it's like a big change all of a sudden like that's not how you're going to get the adoption of of whatever new thing you're trying to to, to bring forward yeah you're not uh you're not and we we do work with uh with governments we work with institutions that are very well established and can't uh, disrupt them because they're partners right yeah so it's about uh building something together that's better uh and uh the language of, of disruption isn't uh, isn't suited to these contexts for that reason. Is that we're we're here to help them. We're not here to disrupt them. We're here to to to, to yeah. I think it's an important thing to keep in mind. I'm I'm saying that also for myself. I think sometimes it's very easy to get a little bit stuck in the code and the data and forget that mm -hmm. this is at the service of people, not at the service yeah. of the thing itself. Um, I I wanted to move on a little bit when when we had. Um, uh, one of our earlier chats, you, you, you mentioned one of the things you wanted to touch on was uh, um, the financing of, of um, how we collect data and, and how you, you thought that might change a lot in the, in the humanitarian world. I, I wanted to expand a little bit, um, know a little bit what you had in mind on that. Well, the, here's the issue. Um, and this, this is something that, that came into my mind when I was talking to some old timers, um, you know, like 15 years ago, and they were, they were telling me that, um, things like, uh, uh, WFP VAM and FuseNet. Uh, so these are like the, the big, uh, food security analysis, um, um, projects in the world, but these things didn't exist until the 1980s when, um, uh, 
when there was structural adjustment and um, in fact, uh, there were large budget cuts in the um, in ministries of uh, agriculture all over the world. And, and therefore we had a lot less data to go by. Um, and this, 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 this was an issue in the late eighties and 1990s. And therefore the international community needed to, to fill the gap by, um, producing data of its own. Um, and the way this, this usually happened is that, uh, you'd get, um, a donor would fund an agency or an NGO. Uh, to, to do a specific data project. So, you know, you'd have, uh, you know, the embassy of Belgium would fund a nutrition survey in, in Haiti and, um, you know, you'd get a report with a Belgian logo and, um, um, you know, the PDF would be online somewhere and, and life went on. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that this is going to be the way data is financed in the future. Because now, um, because of the fact that data is now considered to be um, ideally open, uh, the data should be shared, uh, the data systems should be interoperable. These are all things that are um, filtering down and percolating down from the uh, Secretary General's um, data strategy. So if, if that's the case of data on, on vulnerability and, 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 and all sorts of data that the UN uses are meant to be, um, uh, to be open, um, that means that they might be funded differently. Not one-to-one, -one, like I just uh, described, like from, from donor to, to agency. Um, uh, and I think what might actually, what we might see more of is, um, the donors pooling their, um, their money into one pot. Funding um, and, and funding um, data collection uh, and not necessarily funding a specific agency for data collection. And uh, they would fund data collection with the um, understanding that the data would then be uh, made public uh, or would be made open uh, for, for, for others to use. So you're, you're going from a model that's essentially point to point, uh, which was uh, you know donor uh, pays for an agency that works for the government to produce one data point. Uh, to now um, a network of people paying for data and uh, but paying for open data. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a more networked uh, way of, of financing data collection. Um, and I think it, it's, it is breaking down the, um, it, it could potentially um, change the way uh, we've, we've, we've financed uh, data collection in the past. What do you think is making that change? Is it that the fact that now there is this more, this this push for all of that to be open, whereas it was more of a case by case before? Well, I, I think it's uh, the um, a lot of the the donors who do pay for for, for all this data, uh, they've now built up their own analytical capacities quite a bit, and uh, they have their own analytical cells in their capitals, and they want access to the data, and they want to access to each other's data, and um, um, that means, um, making data open has a, a lot of value to them and that's changing the way, uh, this is being, uh, this is being funded. Now I'm not saying that the, um, we're, we're going to see a wholesale change in the next uh, two or three years, but, uh, uh, I'm, I'm suspecting that this is something that's, uh, that's coming down the pike, uh, and that, um, one of the, the key assumptions we had about, um, how you fund data in, in humanitarian circles is, um, um, this is, is going to change, uh, because technology is en enabling it. Uh, there's the demand for, well, the technology is enabling it. That's one, uh, the demand on the donor side for data is increasing. And I think they want the, the data directly rather than having it through a filter, through an agency filter. Um, and, uh, the capacities for data use within the agencies is also quite, um, has, 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 has become much, um, much larger. I mean, in, um, the, most, most UN agencies, uh, have, uh, um, data scientists, uh, working for them. They do work on data products, the level of the quality of, um, analysis, uh, I, I've seen that increase over the past few years because you've got more, uh, savvy people in the right places. So, uh, and I think this is, this is a good thing, by the way, uh, this means that, uh, uh, we, we will get, uh, better data products overall. Um, but it does mean that, uh, something we've been very used to is, 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 is going to change. What, what do you think is going to be the impact on like at the level of the, the WFP? 
Well, for, for WSP, for us, uh, if, if we get access to, to more data, it means the tools like uh, the Hunger Map 5 will be uh, enhanced. Uh, we'll be mm. able to uh, not look at just hunger, but perhaps other factors uh, and um, better understand the world around us. I think all, all that is, is, is it's very, very positive uh, overall. So um, now I think the, um, you also need to be very flexible. You need to be more outward looking than, uh, than we might have been in the past. Um, because what's, uh, what now matters is your ability to network, uh, your ability yeah. to bring things together. So I, I told you about this product prison. So, um, which is the, the, this, this climate data front end. And uh, the value of that is that it does bring together data from disparate sources into one place, uh, where, where, where governments can use it. That's been, uh, declared a digital public good by the secretariat of the, uh, digital public goods Alliance. Um, that's actually, uh, the UN plus, uh, uh, led by UNICEF, uh, um, you've got other agencies there as well. Um, and, um, that means that data is now not just about the agency and you know, maybe that ministry you're working with, but it's, it's, it's also about everyone else. So it's a lot more about coordination, uh, and working externally and out in a way that's outward looking and, uh, with much more awareness of the external context than, than ever before. So it's, uh, um, I think we've done a lot of very good things with data, by the way, over the past 20 years, and I've, I've described some of them, um, but now we need to be, um, um, good, uh, good data citizens with, uh, with all of our partners. And that's, uh, going to require again, a change in, uh, probably in our architecture, um, in the, the data governance rules that we have, um, and in generally our approach with, um, uh, with other institutions. What's like now recently you, you, you changed like your, your position, your role has changed. Um, I'm, I'm guessing now you have a bit more of a overarching role where the, the digital aspect, the data aspect is, is one component of the things that you have to take into consideration to, to be able to, um, solve some of the, the, um, food insecurity in Haiti. I, I'm, I'm quite curious as to what role does that play now in your current role role? So the data is critical here. Um, I think one of the big exercises we use for, for planning in Haiti is the IPC. The IPC is uh, integrated food security phase classification. Uh, it's a traffic light system, uh, that, um, assesses the, um, severity of food insecurity at the, uh, uh, subnational level in, uh, in many countries in the world. It's, uh, something that it, it's a tool that's existed for, um, I'd say maybe 15 years, it was piloted in, in Somalia and, um, now implemented in, um, in, in, in countries in Africa, Latin America, um, Asia. It's, um, it's the system that the international community uses to, um, declare a famine. For example, there's a very clear protocol to declare famine. You've got thresholds. There's a committee that works at it and, uh, it's brought a lot of rigor to the process. So here in Haiti, we don't have a famine. We're, uh. Uh, you've got five levels and famine is level five in the system in, in the IPC, but here we've got 1 million people in level four, according to the IPC. So that's an uh, emergency. 1 million people living, um, uh, on, on, on the brink of, uh, of famine essentially. So the next step would be, would be, would be famine. Um, and, um, having that kind of data, uh, and having consensus around the data is extremely important. So this is a tool that, um, uh, the government leads with, uh, the focal partners, but WFP is there, FAO is there, uh, UNICEF is there, uh, the, 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 the other, um, important partners, national, international are represented in this committee. And, uh, we do it twice a year. The next one's in September, I, I think. And, uh, we use this mechanism to bring all the data to the table and, um, understand what the situation in Haiti is like. So the last, uh, IPC was done right after the, uh, the earthquake we had, um, here in, in, in August, uh, last year, uh, it helped, uh, send a very strong signal to the donor community. So overall, I mean, I told you about the 1 million people living in, on the brink of famine, but you also have, uh, an additional 3 million that are in phase three, which is crisis. So if you take crisis plus emergency, it's, it's, it's over 4 million people in Haiti who need, uh, humanitarian aid. And that was a, a, an extremely strong signal to the, to the international community, uh, about needs in Haiti. So. Um, I, I, I like the fact that we have, uh, these data points, to, um, that we share with other agencies, that there's consensus around these numbers. Uh, they're very, very useful. 
But then, uh, as we said earlier on in the talk, Max, uh, food insecurity is essentially dynamic. Uh, so we haven't done uh, the IPC in a few months. And if we were to update it today, I'd say we uh, um, we probably have a different number today. I mean, down there, and I, I'm, I'm sort of pointing down at the city here, uh, there's been uh, gang violence. I mean, a month ago, you had almost 200 people were killed in clashes, and then you had uh, thousands of IDPs uh, because of the the fighting among gangs, and uh, I, I, that wasn't captured in the in the IPC we did recently. Uh, I'm not even sure we'd be able to collect data uh, in in some of these neighborhoods just because it's too dangerous, and I wouldn't want to put my people at risk. I mean, uh, is is it worth sending someone uh, to one of those neighborhoods uh, if if they could get either kidnapped or shot? Uh, it's it's not worth it. Uh, so, um, so that's that's how these new technologies could help us um, um, with um, um, assessing the extent of food security in, in Port au Prince. Um, so I think, yeah, data has become more important in a context like, uh, like Haiti, uh, we might need to work on making it more and more dynamic. Um, and again, sharing the data is also, um, a, a huge issue here. Uh, if, if we're able to, um, make sure that, uh, data flows between, um, the government, the, the agencies, uh, the local, um, local organizations and that it's shared with, uh, uh, civil society. I think we we get to a place where um, we get a very productive debate around uh, um, around needs and, and humanitarian response in, in Haiti. Uh, that's that's what I'd like to see. I'd, I'd like to take a step back from from the data and and, and focus on like the people a little bit, like because we're, we're talking numbers and like you know the data is basically like either an image or a, a spreadsheet, but that represents real people behind. I can also imagine uh, or. I mean, I don't know if I can, but the, the, there's probably some very hard decisions that need to be made that come from the insights that you gather about. We're talking about people who have insufficient food. Like this is a very serious problem with very serious consequences. Absolutely. How do you even start to to, to make those decisions? Uh, like more on a on you know on a human level about like reconnecting with the fact that these are um real peoples whose lives are are affected where every percentage of of accuracy that you can gain it probably has a direct impact on on people's livelihoods look uh, all these exercises that involve data in humanitarian contexts um have that um embedded in them is that we are talking about people we're talking about people in desperate need uh and uh that means we need to get that means we need to do the job right we need to be able to um, to be accurate. We need to um, be confident with the findings, uh, or else, yeah, the result could be that people who need um, who need help don't get it, or that we allocate resources in the wrong way. So, um, we we need to have a, a professional, a high standard uh, for uh, for all these exercises. So, but th at the same time, we need to realize that the uh, you know you, you can't. Um, we can't get everything right. Um, I, 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 I think I've, I've often, um, seen that we go a little bit too far. I think we nitpick too much. Uh, if I, if I, if I can use that term, Max, I know it's not very diplomatic, yeah. but I, I have worked in, on, on, and managed a data team in a, in a UN headquarters. And, uh, I think sometimes we nitpick too much and, um, quite often the big picture, um, is, is enough to get uh, an operation going. If you go from assessment to implementation, there's like a huge gap because uh, you, you have uh, a lot of processes uh, that mediate it. And um, what you need is, is, of course, a strong assessment, but then you also need uh, the, the people on the ground to be uh, um, just as rigorous in order to get the right, the desired outcome. So if you're an analyst, you're not God, uh, but you need, you're a professional and you need to be professional in the uh, the work you do, you need to be able to, to turn around data quite quickly. And you're not working in a, in a university if you're working in a humanitarian agency. I mean, we need to know an 80% of accuracy is fine. Uh, because if you wait for 100% accuracy, the, the report never comes out, uh, the assessment never comes out, the, uh, the, the, um, the targeting is not done, uh, people wait. And, and, you know, and while people wait, they get creative and, and, and uh, you, you get into other types of problems. So I think that, that, that's how I, I would see it is I, I would tell a uh, humanitarian um, analyst uh, that, first of all, people don't care about p-values. Um, if you're at WFP, people will never ask you for a p-value. They'll, they'll ask you for, for the map. They'll ask you for the story. 
Um, and if you're able to get that right, uh, that's most of the work. Um, but uh, being this, this is not a place for perfectionists, unfortunately. You can have a perfectionists working in the agency, but they, I think they, they, they might get frustrated at some point. But if you're in an operational role, you need to be able to to guide day-to-day -day decisions with the best information you happen to have. And, and then you also need to realize it's not all in your hands because uh, folks in the field, they know very well what they're doing. They're, they're really good at targeting. They're good at working with the partners. And um, with uh, what you need to do is, is enable them uh, with, with information so they do their job, uh, their job better. I wanted to, to, to have this conversation because I, I, I talked with Beth Tellman from Cloud to Street and she really recommended talking to you about like the, the like making sure we have a real impact on the humanitarian side. And I've, I've seen you be a little bit critical on some of the things that we've the data science community is doing sometimes about and, and you mentioned, you know, not selling snake oil and and like wanting to have a real impact. What would you like to see happen in, 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 you know, the data science community? Also because of the people listening, a lot of people here are, are people who work with data, are data scientists. What is the thing that you'd like to see more of or, or, or less of actually in, in the whole world of, of data science where people aren't seeing the reality of, of what you might be seeing in, in Haiti right now, for example? Well, I mean, I don't want to throw a, um, a brick into the data science pond here. Uh, I think you guys do a great, uh, a great job overall. Um, but I, I'd say there's still a mismatch between what, um, what I see in the community in, in, in the U S and, um, the needs, uh, here in a country like Haiti, it's just very different. Um, I would, um, I would hope data science, uh, companies in the U S could, uh, either find local partners in a place like Haiti or, or, uh, have a franchise here that really works with us, uh, long-term, uh, not have people come in and out on, 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 on flights. Um, but people who really understand the context uh, of this country. Um, I'd love to see, um, the data science community in the U S help build a data science community in, in Haiti, working with the universities here or the professional training institutes, uh, or with, um, uh, other, other capacities that might be, that might be present in Haiti. Um, because the, the issues that, uh, this country has are not going to go away in a year or two. And, um, this country needs, uh, data scientists and programmers. Um, but, the, um, I'm not sure that the, that the, the, the model of, of, um, uh, that I've seen out there is exactly what, what we need. We need to um, have data science become uh, an accessible discipline. Um, patients need to be able to get trained, um, uh, has data scientists and data science expertise needs to be accessible. Not, not to like the big agency. I mean, we can pay for it. We're, we're, we're WP. We can pay for data science expertise if we need it. But, uh, what, what about the, the Haitian NGOs? What about the local uh, institutions here who have, they, I mean, they have data, uh, they're interested in leveraging their data, but, uh, uh, they can't fly in someone from Miami and pay them $800 a day. Right. So, um, th th this is this. I think there's, there's still a, a, a big gap and, uh, I'm, I'm just hoping the, the field can be a less, um, well, the data science community could, could engage in a way that's this more, um, uh, empowering for, um, and for, 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 for a country like Haiti, uh, and in a way that leads to, to longer term skills being, being built, uh, built here. Uh, that's, that's definitely part of the answer. Um, I'd, um. I think it, it, it is about becoming familiar with your context and, and trying to create opportunities and, um, becoming part of the landscape as, as opposed to, um, um, to a visitor. So, but I, I mean, that's what I've seen some data science people be a uh, great listeners. And that's definitely the, the case with Beth and, uh, and Bessie and the others who work at Clouds the Street. They, uh, they really do take the time to, to, um, listen to, to the people they work with and, um, um, so what I'm hoping to see is that people like them could, um, show how it's done uh, to others and, um, and, 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 and demonstrate how, um, data science can add value in a humanitarian context. Um, and, and, and again, democratize data science and then, and, and have that be, be available to all the institutions, uh, in Haiti, not just the ones with, um, uh, no million dollar budgets. 
I think that's a nice place to to, to start rounding off. I, I I like asking um people for for book or or podcast recommendations. Um, that th- there's a couple of reasons for that. I think it it is quite telling about people um like if what they read or listen to, and then it's just that a lot of these are are communicated through through word of mouth still. So. Would you have uh, any recommendations of things that you might have read or or listened to recently that you think are of of interest? And it it doesn't have to be anything that we talked about uh, right now, but just um, <clears throat> I I mean by that you know fiction for example is 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 a great recommendation. I don't know if um, yeah anything comes to mind. Well, I think for for me, I'd like to encourage people to read uh, the Masters of the Do. Uh, in French, it's called Les Gouverneurs de la Rosée. It's actually an old book. It's written in 1944 by a guy called Jacques Poulain. Uh, he's, a, he's an author and a um, uh, politician um, in, in Haiti. Um, he died when he was quite young. He died in his, uh, in his 30s. I wrote a book about, um, um, about Haiti, about rural Haiti and its, uh, its struggles. It's, uh, it's an easy read. It's light. Well, you can read it in a couple hours. Uh, if you read French, it's, uh, or, or even if you're not that great in French, it's, it's actually, uh, written in the present tense. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's an accessible book. Uh, um, but it is a, about, uh, inequalities, uh, about hunger, about what holds a community back. Um, and, um, I think it's also an inspiring story of hope. Uh, so, um, for, for those who are into novels, I'd, I'd recommend that one. Um, as a food security person, um, I've, I've, I've been on, um, uh, let me see, I think a, a classic is uh, stuffed and starved by Raj Patel. Uh, again, that one's also a few years old. It's, it's not recent, but it's, I think it makes a good read about what's wrong with the, the global food system. And so it's, uh, it's a good inspiration for, for those of us working to change it. Uh, so that's fiction and nonfiction. And in terms of, of podcasts, uh, um, let me see. I, I, I'd like to do a plug for the Humanitarian AI podcast. Uh, it's uh, run by my friend uh, Brent Phillips, uh, great guy, uh, good. He uh, um, always seems to find guests who have something very specific to say, and um, uh, I, I, I find those to be to be good lessons. So uh, check out the Humanitarian AI podcast uh, if you can. Yeah, I'll put all of that in the in the show notes as usual. And uh, I think you that's the one you've been on as well i, I, have, I right. listened to to your um to, to to you on that one in preparation of that so yeah i'll put all of that in the show notes great thank you very much for your time jean martin this has been uh great very insightful and uh yeah really really appreciate you spending some of your valuable time with me You're welcome max anytime good luck with the podcast thank you appreciate it I hope you found this conversation with Jean-Martin Bauer interesting. Talking to people like Jean-Martin who are working directly in the field with the people and trying to help them and how they use data and satellite imagery at the service of the population is something that I want to explore more and more with this podcast. I myself work as a data scientist when I'm not working on the podcast. And sometimes it's easy to get lost in the code and the data and things like that. And I think it's really important to have conversations with people who are very grounded on what they're doing and are critical as well about these tools and how we can continuously make them better because at the end of the day our job is really to help and empower the people on the ground i always find like these conversations stay with me for a few days or a few weeks and i like these because i see them as a bit of a reality check to making sure that what we're doing is still at the service of people anyway if you've made it this far i want to say thanks for listening um, i thank my guests for spending some of the, their valuable time but I want to thank you as well for spending some of your valuable time listening to these conversations with me. Um, If you've enjoyed these so far, I'd like to ask if you can consider leaving a review on Apple Podcast or on Spotify if you're listening there. Or put a comment on YouTube. Let me know what you think of those conversations or how they could be improved. By you providing feedback on the show, that helps me make it better, but it also signals to other people that this is a show worth listening to, that people find value and find it interesting. It also makes it easier for me to reach out to other guests where I can point to some of the feedback that I've gotten and show that there's legitimate interest. It makes it easier sometimes to book some guests. You can also head to mindsbehindmaps.com where you can find all the previous episodes as well as show notes. And you can find a form where you can send me some feedback if you have any suggestions for guests or any feedback on how to improve the show. Thanks again for listening and I hope I'll catch you next time. Cheers. Thank you.